Hi everyone and welcome to our summary on natural clones. So what we're going to be doing in this video is going through the spec reference 6.2.1a and there's obviously two parts to that one and then 6.2.1c. So hopefully by the end of this video you're going to understand what the natural clones are both in plants and animals. First thing that we need to know then is basically the definition of this word clone, okay? Now, we are going to be a little bit more picky about the phrasing that we use. We need to make sure we are using this phrase here, genetically identical. You can't just say they're identical. We need to have that phrase genetically identical in there. Now, when we talk about clones in A-level biology, it's not just a whole organism that we're talking about. We can also talk about clones of cells as well. So just bear in mind that a clone may be an entire organism, but it may just be a group of cells. In terms of how these natural clones come into existence, then this is going back to some of the work we did back in module two, looking at the process of mitosis. Now, mitosis is one of those things that occurs within the asexual reproduction route of reproduction. And this is how we are going to make those genetically identical offspring. So asexual reproduction, remember only one parent is involved. Therefore, all of the offspring of that parent will be genetically identical to the parent cell itself. And this is going to occur through the process of mitosis great time to look back at the mitosis video there and remind yourself about that process. So why do we have these natural clones? Why is it an advantage for organisms to actually create genetically identical copies of the parent? Well, if we go to the most simple one, the one we looked at GCSE there, that if that parent has characteristics that are advantageous to that particular environment it finds itself in, because the offspring will be genetically identical to that parent, then they will all have that same advantage. So if the parent has an advantage, then all of the offspring that come from it will have the same advantage. Secondly, we only need one parent in order for this to occur. Therefore, that sort of negates the need to go and find a mate and all of those problems of actual sexual reproduction. And because we're only looking at one parent, then we've got a rapid rate of reproduction as well. Now, this is going to be very beneficial to our organisms because if they find themselves in a situation where the conditions are suddenly favourable, so it's been a long drought, for example, and then all of a sudden there is enough moisture to make it worthwhile reproducing, they can do this very quickly. So because of that rapid rate of reproduction, we can get a rapid population increase when the conditions are right. There are, of course, disadvantages, though. So always bear in mind that when we're looking at any of these processes, think about both sides of that coin. What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? So when it comes to disadvantages, then if they're all genetically identical to one another, we don't have that genetic diversity. So that means there's a lack of variation within the population and therefore one environmental change that they're not going to be resilient to can wipe out the whole lot. OK, secondly, that idea of being able to reproduce rapidly, that can lead to overcrowding as well. If you imagine being able to produce large numbers of offspring in a short space of time, then if they're all within that one area, we get overcrowding, which can then produce a bit of an issue in terms of providing the relevant resources for them. What we're going to do now then is move on to have a little look to see how these natural clones occur in plants, first of all, then in animals. So in our plants, then we're looking at this thing called vegetative propagation. What do we mean by vegetative propagation? Well, it's reproduction from vegetative parts of a plant. Now, when we're looking at vegetative parts of a plant, we're talking root tips, shoot tips, the axillary buds, which are the stem and leaf connections on there, and the vascular cambium. And hopefully we remember from our earlier work on plant tissues that the cambium is found between the xylem and the phloem within those vascular bundles there. Now, what we actually find then is that 
we've got these cells, special name of cells called meristem cells, which are basically the stem cells of our plants. Now, what those allow our plant to do is reproduce asexually. So what we tend to find, these meristem cells then are located, surprisingly, in the root tips, the shoot tips, the axillary buds and the vascular cambium. And therefore, that is where we can carry out our vegetative propagation. We're going to have a little look at this range of processes then that allows us to actually clone our plants. So this is how plants are cloning themselves. Remember, this is the natural way. So the first one they can use are these things called runners or stolons. OK, now you've probably seen these. If you've looked at strawberry plants, for example, you will have seen these runners because from the main strawberry plant, if we look at the picture, there's our main strawberry plant then what we have are these little bits that kind of come off these runners. Now, at the end of those runners, you can see is a new little strawberry plant. That strawberry plant is genetically identical to the parent. So runners are these horizontal stems just growing along the surface. You can see they're not actually underground. They're sitting on the surface of the soil there and they can then develop little roots at the end here that allow it to then obviously take root get the minerals it needs from the soil, etc. Option two for our plants is using things called rhizomes. Now, a rhizome is similar in some ways to our runners in the fact that they are horizontal stems, but rhizomes grow underground. And the best example of this is in our ginger plant. And we can see in the picture there that this is obviously our little rhizome that's then growing horizontally underground there. And that's actually what you can eat. So if you go to the supermarket, you buy some root ginger. This is what you are actually consuming, the rhizomes of that plant. The technique is something called a sucker. Now, suckers quite simply are where we get new stems growing from the roots of the plant itself. And a great example of this is a very common plant in the UK called Forsythia. You always be able to spot it because it's a beautiful, bright yellow bush. Particularly, you'll see it coming into flower around about the kind of March, April time. You get these beautiful, bright yellow bushes. Now, the great thing about that is because we have these suckers, then that means that when you kind of trim that bush back, we're going to get these new stems growing from the roots, creating this lovely bush. Hence why loads of people have it in their gardens. Fourth technique are bulbs. Now, when we talk about a bulb, you're probably familiar with a range of plants that are bulb based. I've given you the example there of a hyacinth. Now, the bulb itself is this underground stem and it's then gonna grow this little series of little fleshy bases of a leaf. Now, we can see this down here. So if we have a look, there's our main part of the bulb. And then you are going to get these additional bits coming off the side, okay? So what we have is this little fleshy leaf base and then an apical bud. And that is then gonna allow it to grow upwards and form the new plant come spring. Now. Depending on what plant we're looking at, some of them only have a single apical bud, others have multiple apical buds. But each apical bud that we get grows into a new plant there. Fifth version of our techniques here are things called corms. Now, these are again an underground stem, but what they've got are these scaly leaves and buds. And another flower that's quite common in UK gardens is something called a gladioli. And what we see is this is our main little sort of starting point, if you like. This is what you would typically buy in a garden centre and plant underground. And then if you look at it later on, so you sort of dig it up a year or so later, then what you're going to find are that you've got all these additional little growths. OK, so you can see all of these on here. Those are our corms. OK, so they've grown out from that original bit that we planted. Sick technique is on the leaves. Now there's a really cool kind of plant here that lots of biology labs have, not all of them sadly, but if your biology lab doesn't have one, you should encourage your biology teacher to get one, called Calanco. Now this is a really cute little plant because around the leaf, so this is our main plant leaf here, then you can see there's these little bits sticking out the side. 
Now, each of those is a clone of the parent plant. So we literally have new little plants growing all the way around the leaves themselves. So clones growing on leaf margins is another way that we can get clones in our plants. Seventh technique are tubers. You are all familiar with a tuber because you are all familiar with a potato. Now, potatoes are underground stems produced by the plants. So you start off with a single potato, plant it in the ground, and then what's going to happen through the growing season is there are going to be more tubers attached so that when you then pull that plant out at the end of the growing season, you've got loads of potatoes. Really simple way to actually get more food. Quite simple. So those are the different techniques that plants can use to create these natural clones. We then need to consider the techniques that animals use. Now, in terms of the familiar version, then if we go to good old mammals like humans, then we have our natural clones in the form of an identical twin. So all that's happened there is the zygote, that fertilized cell that we've started off with, has divided as normal as it always does to produce new offspring. But at some point in those divisions, it's actually split to become two separate cells. So what we then have are these two individuals that are then going to obviously grow, divide and become two complete offspring. But they will have identical DNA because they obviously started from that same zygote. So it's the same egg, the same sperm fertilized that one cell. And then as that's divided into two separate cells at some point in the division, then we have got two individuals that will come into existence, both genetically identical to one another. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when I update with any more videos. And don't forget to visit the website as well, where you can find some more useful bits and pieces to help you with your A-level biology revision.